Promises to Zion founder of that ministry is here this morning, Jamie Rogerson. He's our own associate pastor. He's going to be giving us the word. Um, Jamie took a giant leap of faith last year by resigning from his full-time job and um, <coughs> stepping out to full-time ministry and work of the Lord. And we've been so blessed by his testimonies of his um, ministry trips and evangelism out on the West Coast in San Francisco and the projects of Brooklyn and even here in Dover. Um, as the name of his ministry implies, he's got a huge heart for Israel. Um, regional coordinator for the Day to Pray for the Peace of Jerusalem, and also him and his wife Christine host a conference here every year um, honoring that. So I'd like to, you know, everybody give him a warm round of applause this morning. Good morning. Good God, I just thank you for the opportunity that you've given me, Lord, and I do not take this opportunity lightly. Father, I just pray that you anoint <clears throat> my lips and you give exactly how you've given it to me, that you give me the words and the ways to speak, that it not be of my speech, but of your speech, Lord. I pray your word comes forth, and I pray that everything that is said is meant for edification, of this body, growth of this body, personally, each person, in their own walk, their personal walk with you, Lord, that only every single person together makes up this one body, and let this body be strong, let this body grow, and let this body be fruitful in everything that we are given. We honor you, Lord, and we pray we honor you with our words, we pray we honor you with our deeds, and we thank you, Lord, just for the honor of being called sons and daughters yes. of the Most High. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so today, um, and I was going to continue in John, although we're going to be going through John, in, in the recent events that have been happening in my life, and as I've always said, I'm always going to teach you exactly what I'm going through. Uh, and... I'm going to teach you exactly where I'm at with the Lord because I, I, I want to keep it real. <laughs> you know, I'm not someone that knows all the answers. And that's really what this, this whole message is about. And life is going to throw you curveballs. Life is going to be extremely hard. Life is life. It's not predictable. And you're not going to know all the answers, but we're going to get to... <clears throat> What is truth in your life? And I've already touched on this. I did a message, um, I believe it was called What is Truth? And maybe we'll just call this What is Truth Part 2. Um, I never really got, a, a, you know, what the message name would be, nor do I really, really care about that. But it's definitely what is the purpose? What's the purpose of life? What's truth? And so we're going to turn to John um, 18 and go to verse 28. I'm going to read this through. So it's uh, verse 28. We're going to go all the way to 38. And this is uh, to set the theme. This is uh, Jesus in the court of Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was a very cold individual. <laughs> he, he was very callous to the point where he was so callous that the emperor Tiberius, which was his um, boss, called him back because <laughs> he really had total disregard of the Jewish people, really most likely. I mean, it doesn't, I don't have any writings of him saying how much he hated being where he was, but he was definitely not sensitive to the Jewish people, and there was just a callousness of him. And so here we are, he's, he's, Jesus is now being brought before him. He's tried to get rid of the problem, and it came back to him. You know, Jesus is now once again before him. And then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the to pray praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but they might eat the Passover, which is quite hilarious because they're literally condemning this man they, <laughs> sinfully to death. They're, they're calling for his death, yet they're concerned about not being able to come into, you know, into the praetorium because they don't want to be defiled for Passover. Mm -hmm. So they're in the act of doing something sinful. Um, this is, that, that is the world. That's the world you're living in today. That's an example of everyday people right there. Total ignorance of the things they do in the midst of. 
What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Meanwhile, they have no evidence of him being an evildoer, but let's continue. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You, are, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is the truth hears who hear, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. What is truth? You almost can hear the cynicism in that. You hear this in a lot in the world when you're sharing the gospel. You hear this a lot on those talk shows that rail against religion. And now uh, religion is kind of becoming uh, an attack word. Because of election, the election, they're blaming the Christians. And I'm seeing even friends that of mine writing things that we have to abolish religion. This is something not new. This is an example of Pontius Pilate going, what is truth? You know, you have all the truth? You have all the answers? That's really what, what the world will be saying to us. And a lot of times, that's what we're really seeking anyway. Truth, the, the actual truth. Definition is the quality of being true, or the second definition of that, a fact or belief that is accepted as true. In the Greek, it's called alidiha, or alidiha, um, which means unconcealedness. It means all things that are to be revealed are revealed. It literally means nothing hidden, which I found very interesting. And if you kind of look at the whole marriage ceremony where we've talked about, that's literally when we're married to the bridegroom, when we're married to Jesus himself, what happens in that, in that ceremony? The veil is lifted, revealed, truth revealed. You, ha you see so many things in, in culture trying to understand the meanings of life. What is the meaning of life? What is truth? What is, and you can go all the way back um, to 2,300 years ago, you have, or 2,500 years ago, in fact, where you have Buddha. You know, everyone likes likes to. Like, that seems to be the hip thing that people are following today because it allows you to find your own truth within yourself. Mm -hmm. Therefore, taking any real change that must have to happen when you let go of yourself. So it's all seeking your inner truth for you, and. It's in pretty much what Buddha says, your purpose in life is to find your purpose and give your whole heart and soul to it. To me, that's pretty vague. <laughs> your purpose in life is to find your purpose? Well, what if I don't even know what my purpose is? How, how is that gonna help me? And then 2,300 years back, which is only a couple hundred years after Buddha, you have Aristotle. Uh, he, he's a student of Plato. Plato studied under Socrates, and then you have Aristotle. He's considered the greatest thinker of philosophy for Western thought, which is our society today, Western civilization. civilization. And he developed the very formal way of reasoning. And he claims that it's the pursuit of happiness. Sound familiar? In our, you know, the, the pursuit of happiness? Um, was the meaning of life. And he, in fact, writes, the function of man is to live a certain kind of life, and this activity implies a rational principle, and the function of a good man is 
the good and noble performances of these, and if any action is well performed in accord with appropriate excellence, if this is the case, then happiness turns out to be an activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. So virtue, truth, all these words, and then you go even further to the future. And I was reading a book just recently, and this is a, a person who is a group of four authors. I'm not going to go into who the author is because um, I'm not giving glory to it at all uh, on the pulpit, but he's somebody that was considered one of the people that started the, the, the 60s revolution, the counterculture revolution. And he went out into the mountains onto a fire tower because he just wanted to get away from all the things that he just thought was futile. And he thought maybe by isolating himself. How many people have done this? So many people have done this. And it's good when you're doing it in the name of Jesus or it, it, if you're seeking God. But if you're just going to seek yourself. And then it was amazing. I'm reading exactly what he, he writes here. Enough, I've said it all, and there's not even desolation in solitude, not even in this page, not even words, but the prejudice show of things impinging on your habit energy. Oh, ignorant brothers, oh, ignorant sisters, oh, ignorant me. There's nothing to write about. Everything is nothing. There's ev everything to write about. Time, time, things, things, why, why. Fools, fools, these fools, 12 fools, 8. 65 million swirls of innumerable epoch of fools. It was the same for our forefathers, who were a long day, long of dirt compounded. They fooled, fooled, no transmission of great knowing to us from their chromosome worms. <laughs> you think he knew the answers? <laughs> and this is an author that spawned an entire revolution, counter-revolution, to everything people were growing up with up until that time. Going to church, going, there's got to be the deeper truth, which allowed the, the Middle Eastern type of spiritualism to seep in soon thereafter, because there's got to be something else. Virtue, a behavior showing high moral standards, Conformity of one's life and conduct to moral and ethical principles of our brightnesses. Uprightness. Everywhere we see people seeking pleasure, wealth, and good reputation is what Aristotle said. So here is this man in the 60s, and here is Aristotle saying this very same thing that people say today. The rich keep getting richer. The poor keep getting poorer. Yep. Uh, all people are just saying that this is what's happiness. Buy this and you'll find happiness. Listen to this and you'll find happiness. If you own that, you will find happiness. Same thing, 2,300 years ago. And then this author literally says, nobody's given me the truth. All the philosophers have, have let me down. And he was miserable up on that mountain for the entire time he was there. What is truth? What is purpose? What is virtue? Let's turn, because I don't know about you, you, but I'm ready for some scripture. Because <laughs> that's, that's where you're going to find it. And put, turn to Ecclesiastes, one of my favorite books. And I've gone through this again. We're going to read through the whole first chapter. And I want you to listen to the similarities of what's going on here. <clears throat> the words of the preacher. This is uh, chapter 1. The son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity. Of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? One generation passes away, another generation comes. But the earth abides forever. That's right. The sun also rises, the sun goes down, and hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes towards the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. You see, things continue to move on. When I'm gone, the wind will still blow. Amen. When you're gone, yeah. the sun is going to still rise and the yep. sun is going to still set. That's true. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. I love that line. 
All the rivers run into the sea, and the sea is not full. All of your endeavors, everything that you pour into that's of you, you'll not see any satisfaction. The more you pour into it, all things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. So all of these things, this is a new thing that's happening. Uh, well, since politics are the biggest thing now, and that's all that's thrown in our mind, think that that was the worst campaign ever with the most mudslinging. Wrong. You go back to just the history of the United States 200 years ago, there, it was just as much mudslinging back then as there is today. And you go even further back into the Roman times, there was mudslinging then. Propping things up to be truth when it wasn't. Manipulating things. It's no different. It's the same thing over and over and over again. It's vanity. Vanity. That which, and now verse 8, that which has been is what will be, that which is done, what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new? <clears throat> It has already been in ancient times before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be remembrance of things are to come, but those who will come after. You see, we, we, we kind of sit in this precipice in the United States where we're kind of above everything, it seems, and we, we, we limit ourselves to the experience of really true suffering because we've been blessed. You look back at the Library of Alexandria back in Roman times, that was considered the Library of Congress of today. You had all the records there. Now I want you to put in your mind, imagine that being burned to the ground. Every book and all of these things that have been poured to, through through the centuries out of a man's endeavor to write all this culture and art and all of this burned to the ground. That's exactly what happened in Alexandria, that library. Imagine the things. It was filled with all the antiquity writings of the time. Gone. Just like that. Who knows what could have been in there. Just like our Library of Congress could be gone. The whole knowledge that even sh can talk about what's happened in the past. If there's no one there to remember it, it's as if it never existed. Exactly. It's almost a futility. What's the point? What's the point? Vanity. It's an excessive pride in or admiration of one's appearance or achievements. So not only is it how you look, but what you've done. The quality of being worthless or futile. The vanity of man. And what both quotes of Aristotle and this author in the 60s wrote is is. Confirmed in 2 Timothy 2, uh, chapter 2 through, or verse 2 through 5. Um, For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And then in verse 7, it says, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Truth. What is truth? What is purpose? What is virtue? John 8, verse 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let's turn to that, John 8. John verse eight. And that was uh, or John chapter eight verse thirty-two. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, "We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been in the bondage to anyone." How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. You see, 
all this suffering, all this stuff giving up. Here I'm in a, in a state where the minute I go into full-time ministry, I'm told I have congestive heart failure. Uh, I run into financial issues on a regular basis, but every single time God comes and has an answer for that because I put my faith and trust in Him. My mother gets diagnosed with cancer. I'm no stranger to suffering. And I'll sit there and go through my life and I could easily go, why God? Why? Why did when I was a child, I was sick for most of my childhood and never really got to experience my childhood? Why when I was a teenager, my family broke up and I had no finances and ended up becoming homeless and having to rely on somebody else other than my family? Why God, when I was in my 30s and I finally got married and started the family that that wife went off and started having affairs with another person. Why, God? Why? Why me? That is the cry of the world. Why me? Vanity. Vanity. How could that happen to me? Let alone there's a child somewhere out there in Africa dying and barely had, didn't even make it, just born and died of the AIDS virus? Why is there racism? Why did six million Jews have to die? Why? John 17, verse 17, chapter 17, verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into this world, I, as, I also have sent them into the world. In verse, or verse 19, and for the, their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Sanctified, God bless you. Um, that in the Greek it's hagiazo. Hagiazo. It means to make holy. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Vanity is the symptom of pride. Sin is the symptom of all the suffering you see in this world. That's part of the answer. Sin is why there's human suffering. Sin is why certain people are the haves and certain people are the have-nots. It's just the sin of this world. So without the truth, the truth is God's word. The truth is Jesus' sacrifice that leads to our holiness. Not by holiness given and freely just taken, yes, but we didn't earn any of it. And that's the process of understanding exactly what God has given us through this truth. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. This is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Righteousness is another word for virtue. All these things that all these great minds try to philosophize is right here. And always has been. And always will be. No other paths of truth offer a distinct answer on how to tolerate these sufferings that you go through in life. They're individualistic for you. Which means you have to individualistically pull close to here and make that relationship with Jesus Christ your own. Because right. only then you're going to find your true identity of who you are. And only through your identity will you be able to conquer and walk through these sufferings with your head held high. And sometimes, sometimes, you have to put down your inklings of wanting to be alone and allow people in to strengthen you. That's where my biggest, hardest thing is, because when I let people in, I generally get betrayed. But that cannot stop me from wanting to be more like him, more like what he says I am, not what the world says, not what behaviors of other people say, not anything of those manner. I can't allow that to dictate. And the only way I can rise above those things is by pulling close and hanging on to the truth that is Jesus Christ. Amen. Through the word we find truth. Truth gives us freedom. Freedom gives us choice. Choice by faith brings righteousness. Romans 
Chapter 1, verse 16 through 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first, and then also the Greek, which is us, it's the Gentile. For in it, the righteousness of God is received from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Turn back to uh, Ecclesiastes. Go to chapter 12 in Ecclesiastes. Verse 1. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come, and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. It really, and it's funny because I just, when I took a break from writing my message, because <laughs> when I'm trying to finish the message on Friday, first we have a stink that's in the, in the library that literally was overpowering. Then all of a sudden the lights flicker right when I'm on, like the Holy Spirit's really talking to me. I'm like, all right, God, praise God. I see what you want to do. And then all of a sudden the lights go out completely. <laughs> and... I'm just like, so then I go home and I had to finish my, my message on Saturday and I took a break and watched a movie and it was called Peter and the Farm. It was a documentary of this guy who's Mr. Intellectual, who was an artist who decided to buy a farm and his, he was with his family and one of his friends who drew, uh, artist friends painted and he, the farm and he said to, to this farmer, Peter, he said, you know, this is going to be a lot of work, this farm. And he goes, no, nah, it's going to be fun. Now fast forward 20 years. His wife left him. His kids want nothing to do with him. He's an alcoholic. He's old. He's starting to feel the pains of age. And this farm is no longer fun. The farm has become him. And he's captured and held captive by the farm itself. Sound familiar? amazing how God like sends me in the right directions all the time. So go to uh, the end of Ecclesiastes. We're going to go towards it's going to be Ecclesiastes 12 verse 9. We're going to go 9 through 14 so it's just the next page. Chapter 12 Verse 9 through 14. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. So you see, just because you're not going to know all the answers doesn't mean you put, don't put in the effort to find whatever answers God's willing to give you. Because that's what's going to help you. That's what's going to build you. The pre pre preacher sought to find acceptable words and what is written, what is upright, words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. I love that. Like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. Who is that one shepherd, I wonder? And further, my son, be admonished by these of making many books. There is no end. And much study is wearisome to the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13 says, Each, every, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. So everything you're doing now and everything you're going to do is going to be brought into account. How much of it is truly edifying you and how much is it truly the purposes of God? This is the key to life. Truth is the word and Jesus. Purpose is to live according to his purpose for you. His purpose for you. Virtue comes by keeping close to him and allowing his righteousness to confirm who you really are. 
Not who you think you are, who you really are, according to who he says you are. The key of to life, the key to everything? How do you get the key to everything? Why is all this suffering? Why is this happening? And, you know, really the people who go through suffering are the people who have lost entire families, whether it be in the Jewish experience or in the black experience. There are some families that were wiped out in slavery. Done. You don't even know about them. You never will know about them. Never written. There is no writing about it. None. Gone. Where's the justice? Where's the answer? Where's the key to that? I want to know everything, God. I've said this multiple times in my arguments with the Lord. Give me everything. I want to know it all. <laughs> you have to go to the locksmith who made the lock to get this key. Guess what happens when you go to the locksmith to get that key? You're not going to get it. He does not give it to you. Ecclesiastes, pull back to chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse, once again, 9. Oh, actually, yeah. Yeah, chapter 3. Verse 9. What profit has a worker from that in which he labors? I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he put eternity in their hearts except that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning to end. You can't get the key. You can't get the key. It says right here, no one can find out the works that God does from beginning to end. God is justice and God is good. So there will be justice, as I've said in previous sermons. He is not going to give you the key Though our belief in His Son, Jesus, is part of and is the triune God, Father, Spirit, Son, through Him we must have faith that He will open the door for us. So that door that's closed and locked, let Him open the door and trust in faith that He's going to do right by us. And it might not always feel good. Let me tell you, I'm going through. But I know who my God is. Amen. And I will see this to the very end with him. And I will not blaspheme him. I will not say, how dare you put me through this? How dare you? I'm going to walk through it and know that this is meant for good and yes, hopefully to edify the people who are watching. Someone is always watching. That's right, yeah. Always watching. Amen. I just pray to God that every idle word I've ever spoken is under the blood of Jesus. Amen. I pray to God that every works that I've done or things I've done to go off the path of God is covered by that blood. Yes. We are of God. We are His children. His humble children faithfully letting those doors to be open. Truth, purpose, virtue, righteousness in this life. The fact is Jesus is King, Jesus is Lord, that He died so we can be free from the permanent death of sin. Jesus is the truth, the life. Yes. Through Jesus, you find your purpose. That's right. And through Jesus, you gain righteousness. Yes. It's freely given, but it requires a choice and requires a choice daily. It's not that one, I gave my, you know, gave my heart to Jesus and now cast it to the wind. No, it requires your participation. Faith by faith in that scripture we read. Faith to faith. It means you're always growing. You're always going to go through. Always. So you have to ask yourself, God, who am I? God, who do you want me to be? And God, what can I do? Amen? Amen.
Well, God, I thank you for this word, Lord. And I thank you for each heart, Lord, that, that is placed in. And Lord, I just pray that this provides comfort. It's a hard word, and it was hard for me to even go through it myself as I'm going through it. But there are other people here that are having individual walks that are just as hard, maybe even harder. And it's not me to decide what is hard and hardest. It's, I just have to say yes. So Lord, I just pray that every heart in here just says yes to you every day. I pray that the enemy who tries to steal the value of time, time given to us, Lord, I ask for restoration of that time to every single person here. You placed eternity in our hearts, Lord, because you want to stir us to that truth that Pontius Pilate had standing right before him. Let us not be mocking. Let us not be dis dismissive in our hardships, Lord. But let us just ask and cry of mo for more of you in our lives. Help us be more effective. And I just pray, Lord, that every single person in this place, Lord, when it comes to measuring the deeds and the words that we've done in this short lifetime that is a vapor, it's gone in an instant. Lord, I just pray that it just completely carries its weight of perfect works, Lord, that you used through them, through us as vessels of your glory. We thank you for the honor of being your son and daughter, Lord. We thank you for the honor. The honor of the gift of this grace, but not to abuse it, God. Not to abuse it, but to use it to help free others, to help bring that Pontius Pilate in these worlds to truth. Let us stand, Lord, for you. As it says in your word, whatever we ask in your name, it will be done for the great glory of God the Father. In Jesus' name, we pray.